you know, you can interrupt me in a seminar, that's what I normally would do. Um, and what I have to present tonight is a bit informal in the sense that it, it has starts and stops, so there's points where that can happen as well. Um, so I'll lecture on Picasso. I, I, you know, I got this invitation from Renska to come here, and I think I understood the invitation to be um, an invitation to speak about something very canonical. That was what I remember <laughs> the, uh, of, the, uh, of the invitation. So I said, well, I have a lecture on Picasso. That's pretty canonical. Um, but then I got the program, and it, I, I read that um, most of the speakers would be giving anecdotes about their, their experiences with the artists that they were talking about. And I can tell you, unfortunately, I have none. <laughs> about Pablo, my friend Pablo, um, because um, he died just a few years after I was born and I never met him. Um, anyway, the only anecdote I could, I guess, start with and, and tell is that I have been thinking about, this is part of a project for the future, um, a project on Picasso's modernism that is, you know, is the kind of work that I think is important to do in relationship to the criticism I write about contemporary art, to retell certain narratives of modernity and of modernism itself to rethink sort of relationships to um, moments in the history of modernism. That's one project that I'm constantly involved in and thinking about Picasso has been something that I've been wanting to do for a long time. Um, in fact, early versions of the paper I'm going to read for you tonight go back for me to the early 90s um, when I was a student. Um, thinking about this project has taken me a long time. And what I have to present is still in somewhat of an informal state. Um, so again, that's another reason why you could interrupt me if you wanted to, and I am open to that, so let me just say it again. Let me see how, okay, so it works like that, great. Um, this lecture was originally written right around the time that Picasso's painting in Delos Avenue turned one century old, um, and I haven't published it yet, I'm still trying to think through parts of it, so also reactions would be very much welcome. And I guess I wanted to start where this project started for me in a kind of way it's very um, it's very much related to the way in which I, I operate in the field. It's related to my teaching. So let me start site specifically, um, as it were, bringing myself back to sunny Los Angeles. <laughs> um, site specifically meaning that I'm going to start um, with something like a kind of eureka moment that I have to relate experience that opened up Picasso's painting for me all at once after years of thinking about it and not really getting it very far in the way in which I was trying to approach this work. It occurred while I was teaching Picasso in an undergraduate lecture at UCLA uh, a year or two ago, two years ago. And it happened in the face of accident and chance, which I feel somehow, maybe this is a bit surrealist of me, is still probably the best way to work. Um, since since I arrived at UCLA around five years ago, it seems that I do my best thinking here. What I'm showing you is an image of um, the sculpture garden at UCLA, which is full of kind of some canonical sculptures like that, and also some pretty terrible ones, which I'll show you in just a moment. But it's a very peaceful place, and I wind up walking to and from my car to my office there, and I'm thinking. Um, last fall, they were, or this was two years ago actually, they were renovating the, the sculpture garden, and the sculptures kept shifting and moving around, and new ones were constantly appearing. Um, new for me, as I was new at that point to this place, um, actually that building behind the Sarah, the, the new, well, renovated art building didn't actually exist two years ago, it's, it's newer than that. Um, and as I was thinking about Picasso in my lecture course, one afternoon while walking through the garden, um, the sculpture garden, I was stopped in my tracks. For there, not by the sculpture, <laughs> um, although this one's kind of in the center, Um, for there, amid the standers and the stretchers, amid the drowsy contrapposto posers and sleepy-eyed risers, amid all the deafening reminders of the fact that sculpture, whether figurative or abstract, I think I have, yeah, little David Smith versus Anthony Caro, um, whether figurative or abstract, sculpture for so long remained, in fact, an affair of the vertically oriented human body, of sheer vertical energy itself a trajectory lifting, lifting volume up from the ground, one's eyes to the air. Suddenly, however, a contradictory apparition appeared. Uh, there she is toward the right. <laughs> uh, yes, in the sculpture garden there are some loungers, some horizontal expanders, some huggers of the ground plane. But really these seem to be the exceptions that serve to prove the rule. Perhaps even disguised standers simply rotated into another plane, as if to conquer verticality's contrary. 
But here I was, faced with my apparition. She, of course it was a she, was a squatter. Another exception, surely. A body falling out of sculpture's vertical reaching, a croucher bending down in the opposite gesture, clinging stubbornly to the ground from which sculpture is supposed to escape. Well, anyway, let me just say right away that I knew immediately that I did not like the sculpture, not at all. Um, I could see immediately its formal game, and I didn't like it one bit. The squat here was just an excuse, of course, to turn this female body ever more definitively into an object, not to fuse it with the moist human ground at which it grasped, but to create a new play of abstract geometries and thus of formal distinctions. For this crouched body now formed an oval mass, just like another double of the figure's ovoid head, the sculpture becoming an affair of a circle, or of a newly formed triangle, the figure's arms, an experience of the body doubled over on itself in order to conquer the body's unintelligibility by erupting doggedly again and again into coherent gestalts and coherent forms. And of course, along with this experience of something like mastery in the face of a corporeal collapser, the sculpture mutates ever more definitively into an object, an object for the gaze, a thing of the eye, in fact, the posterior lifted on high, um, rolling buttocks ascending like hilltops into the field of vision of what must be assumed as so many putatively male spectators. My colleague, Nguyen Kwan, at UCLA, calls this sculpture the ass. So, sorry to reveal Nguyen's name for it, but anyway, that's what a lot of the students call it, too. It's, it's the three-letter word that begins with A in English. Um, and in fact, you usually see it from behind when you're approaching it from the art history building. The squatter then went in insistence on formal coherence to a new heightened level of mastery over the female body, a new intensity of voyeuristic control as the corollary to the abstract demands of pure vision. My eureka moment came, I, I'm saying I had one, <laughs> in the face of this thing, um, when I realized suddenly that the most important figure in Picasso's painting that I was going to be teaching that very day was also a squatter. And yet this squatter has almost nothing to do with the reassuring experiences offered up to absent-minded male strollers in UCLA sculpture garden. So I just talked um, some trash about the sculpture. Uh, let me name it for you. It's actually from the 1970s, which is kind of extraordinary to me. Um, do I have a title? It's an artist named Franc Francisco Zuniga, and it's from the 1970s. Um, and actually, just as an aside before I go on, it is a sculpture that I think actually is referencing some of the paintings, not just Picasso's, but also specifically Matisse, that I'm going to talk about tonight, many decades later, and not the most productive of ways, I think. But it got me thinking. Now, it was Picasso's earliest gallerist and critical champion, um, D.H. Conwell, who first suggested that the squatter lies at the heart of the Demoiselle's importance as a modernist work of art. In 1933, notoriously, Conwell identified what he called the birth of Cubism with the second period of Picasso's work upon the Demoiselle in the summer of 1907, wherein Picasso altered the right side of his painting. Indeed, then a bit later, in 1946, Conwell would be more precise, writing again about the Demoiselle. He would say, the right-hand part of the picture begins, in his words, the adventure of Cubism, or in his off-sided formulation, quote, this is the beginning of Cubism, the right-hand side, the first upsurge, a desperate titanic clash with all of the problems at once, end quote. Desperate, perhaps. An upsurge, one wonders, faced with the downward-moving, low-lying squatter who occupies the central place in Conrader's scheme. So the figure I'm obviously focusing on is here on the lower, the lower right part of the painting. <clears throat> By now, a generation of Picasso criticism has utterly debunked the notion that the Demoiselle can be considered in any serious way as the first Cubist painting. And yet, upon the sight of the squatter's body, a whole series of momentous shifts for 20th century art surely do begin in something not so far from a, quote, titanic clash, to use Conrader's words, if not a cataclysm. Infamously or notoriously rather portrayed as a face mounted upon a back, dorsal and frontal at once, as Leo Steinberg memorably put it, the squatter heralds the collapse then of a single viewing position, if not the claims of single point perspective itself. So you, you hear the people.